You're tuned back into agriculture today, and we continue our WASD conversation with K-State grant economist Dan O'Brien and the senior economist at the IGP Institute at K-State, Guy Allen. Dan, Guy, as we continue our conversation, now wanting to talk about soybeans. The same issue with yields being put higher and harvested acres being scaled back that occurred for corn also occurred for soybeans. It wasn't tri quite as pronounced in terms of the yield jump. Uh, USDA, the USDA did project yields at 50.6 bushels per acre. It wasn't a record. Uh, we uh, Some higher number came in like a couple of years ago in 2021, but uh, still a pretty strong number, over 50 bushels an acre. And at the same time, cut back uh, the harvested acres uh, figure well from 82.8 down to 82.35. So did cut that back and uh, uh, supplies, excuse me, the production number ended up about 36 million bushels higher, supplies about 31 by the time we adjusted for some stocks changes. And uh, really for the rest of that supply demand balance sheet, uh, hardly, hardly, uh, any changes that uh, we did see crush soybean crush moved to the high side and uh, guy and i have both been watching the international oil seed markets and uh, uh so higher crush in here here in the u.s uh, gives, gives us opportunity to to uh, uh use ddgs elsewhere to perhaps ship some soybean oil we we shall see uh crush ties in also with renewable uh renewable fuels renewable diesel biodiesel production so you've got all that happening and by the way when you do jump down into the soybean oil supply demand balance sheet i saw about a 200 200 million pound in increase in biofuel usage of, of soybean oil so uh again the same same issue uh continuing on uh with with the development of biofuels on the oil seed side we're having more and more of a domestic focus in for in uh, in the soybean sector. Um, and guys, some, some of the issues with regard to where stocks are held, soybean stocks on farms, about 1.45 billion bushels, soybean stocks off farm at 1.55. Quite often, I, I think we, we would have seen more on farms, more, more movement off of farms into to, uh, commercials. Do you have any thoughts or insight on that? Well, I think the farmer, uh, when he quit selling corn, I think they did continue to sell soybeans a bit. And cash, uh, soybeans were the, the preferred sale there. So that doesn't surprise me. Uh, just to back up a bit, your comment on soybean oil. Uh, look, note your increase in biofuel uses. There's a drop of 50 million uh, uh, in soybean oil drop in exports to uh, 300 billion pounds. Uh, look, U.S. is likely to become a net vegetable oil importer this year with that biofuel demand. So quite a change in the dynamics of the U.S. crush as that continues to grow, but then the switch to export more meal on that. Changing over the world situation on, on the oil seeds, look, ending stocks increase slightly 400,000 metric tons to 14.6. Uh, that's up a bit from last year, which is uh, 102 million metric tons. That's a bit comfortable, still tight, but look, it's uh, the market's feeling increasingly comfortable here as, as we grow those ending stocks across the commodity complex. Um, the, the surprising thing was China let, or USDA left China numbers unchanged. They're still showing China imports at 102 uh, million metric tons of soybeans. Their crush has been sort of lagging in the last uh, few weeks. And I just question whether we're going to see 102 million metric tons of exports, uh, particularly uh, as that reflects on U.S. demand. Our demand has been very, very sluggish with cheap uh, Brazilian soybeans specifically and, and Argentine soybeans there as well. It's going to be interesting to watch the, uh, the change of uh, leadership in Argentina and how that's going to make an economic impact. He's threatened to, to uh, drop the export taxes, as well as, uh, I guess, uh, he's starting to back away a bit from the dollarization of the, the Argentine peso there. But a lot of happening outside of the commodity markets that's going to impact oil seed. You talk about Argentina and the um, 
Uh, you know, that same pattern for that we saw in the corn market between Argentina and, and Brazil as we went back and forth and this trend in Argentine production. Again, two years ago, Argentina had just under 44 million metric tons. Last year, major drought down to 25. This year, back up to projection of, of 50 million metric tons, and that's up too in, in, in this year. So, so again, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of our focus is on on uh, Brazil, and and uh, I I just would reiterate in in country estimates uh, are are uh, uh, well well basically for drops from uh, well at least as much here the USDA dropped the the Brazilian figure from 161 to 157. There are in country estimates of of that and more later. So so again, I I think that uncertainty uh, needs will have to be worked out and and uh, we'll see where February, March, and April for the USDA reports take us in that. Uh, elsewhere, guy, I, he had an interesting comment that will be a net importer. It's a question: Where from? <laughs> you know, where where's yeah. going to come from? Well, wherever the cheapest oil is, uh, it could be um, a lot of it's coming in in, in the uh, used cooking oil and, and other oils, not necessarily uh, that used cooking oil feeds into that market there as well. But sure. yeah, it's going to be interesting. Canada is, I think, a prime uh, opportunity there with their large canola production, canola crust. Expect to see uh, probably the first stop just to be to the north with as canola oil comes in. Um, you mentioned canola, uh, Shelby. Should should we? Uh, do you mind if we shift over and talk about wheat? Uh, Absolutely. Um, canola. Uh, there was a, a winter wheat and canola seedings report. Of course, in Kansas, we paid most attention to the wheat wheat report. We'll talk about that. But on the canola side, they they did show. Uh, 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 basically, an increase from tw 2023 to 2024 of up to uh, uh, it'd be well was about 1,500 acres, uh, up to 3,000 3, acres. Uh, in the, the largest states for canola production, of course, North Dakota, you're talking about 1.9 million, 1.9 million acres, followed by uh, by Montana and Washington. So you know, we have plants being developed in in the in the state that'll take that on. So I I don't doubt that's just the tip of the iceberg for where where we're going with that. In terms of planted acres. Uh, uh, the acreage numbers for winter wheat and in uh, for 2024 plantings, basically that were seeded uh, this last fall, were down about six percent. The Kansas numbers for for winter wheat seedings were at 7.5 million acres. It's interesting, we were at 7.3 two years ago million acres planted, 8.1 a year ago, and now it's 7.5, so we're down 7%, but we're kind of bouncing within that range. Of course, uh, when we, a lot of us look outside our windows, we see blankets of snow, uh, and uh, those of us, uh, other, other than having to scoop it, uh, you know, to get get around, which is a frustrating thing for a lot of folks. Uh, if, if you're a wheat farmer, uh, Guy, I think you you uh, had, had the statement before we came on the air about what this, uh, what the, what the uh, snow is doing right now for uh, for winter wheat yeah well it's sitting under a nice blanket of snow here in kansas which uh given our lack of precipitation it's good to see that nice blanket of snow it uh is keeping the wheat warm although it's it's quite chilly here in manhattan kansas and and i would say just in talking about the wheat supply demand balance sheet uh not a lot of major changes for wheat in uh uh, in that balance sheet, you did see uh, uh, a little bit of a decrease in beginning stocks off of the balance sheet last year, you know, in the 22-23 the, the balance sheet changing and 23-24 affected by it. Uh, and, and really that decrease led to a little bit, a little bit lower stocks used down from 35 down to, to 34 and a half. So not a lot of changes there. We did see the feed residual number for hard red spring wheat uh, uh, decreased uh, down down five million acres, uh, five million bushels, ten million up for soft red winter, five million down for white. And really, the thing that you notice that I notice most for hard red winter that we grow here in Kansas is that the decrease in exports. We were at two hundred twenty four million million bushels of exports in the last marketing year for two thousand twenty two twenty three. We're we're uh, holding steady at one one forty five. 
this year. So uh, there are a number of international factors. Uh, and uh, that guy you can comment on, probably coming out of Brazil and Ukraine, that that have affected the competitiveness of Kansas Kansas hard red winter wheat and U.S. winter U.S. wheat overall. So go ahead, have yeah. a, and talk to that if you'd like. Yeah, just to run through some of these wheat exporting countries, uh, Russia production was up a million metric tons to 91 million metric tons, and their exports were a million tons higher at 51 million metric tons. That ranks as the highest ever. Um, looking at the Ukraine, Ukraine was up just under a million metric tons from the, the December number at 23.4. Exports uh, increased by one and a half million metric tons to 14. So, uh, Despite where that grain may be actually grown, quite a bit of wheat coming out of that Black Sea market, even though the conflict continues there. Just all, elsewhere in the world, uh, looking down at Canadian production, uh, it was unchanged at 31.9 million metric tons, exports up a half million metric tons to 24. Uh, that's compared to 25 and a half last year. European crop. Uh, production was unchanged at 134 million metric tons, exports down slightly. One area I'm sort of watching is Australia. It was unchanged at uh, 25 and a half million metric tons compared to last year's record crop of 39.7. Exports were raised by half a million tons to 19. The thing I'm watching in Australia, they're getting some summer range in some areas which are particularly usually particularly dry in the summer. And uh, it's, that's more of a La Nina situation than an El Nino situation. But I think they're setting up for a very big wheat plant uh, down there in, the, in a couple months as they move into their, their planting season. So keeping an eye on that. You know, I, I, I looking at these wheat markets, and I think wheat producers have, are um, certainly fair to ask, well, when might this wheat situation turn around? And um, uh, Russia <laughs> is... Uh, sounds like, and I'm not saying this is any is it just is, is what it is in the area that they've that they've overtaken of Ukraine. They're farming it, you know. They're farming it, so there's they have a they've increased their land their ag, ag land mass, and it's showing in these quantities. Uh, I have been watching uh, the uh, the weather maps in that area, and depending on which one you look at, some show a little bit of dryness, others show a fair amount. So I, I almost. Uh, I, I think that the world is becoming dependent on very cheap wheat with very cheap currencies for both those both those countries. <laughs> and really, the one thing that might might change that would be uh, just uh, so, something other than this remarkable run of great crops that they've been having, where that now they they've been able to just pretty much flood. Well, flood is a probably a non-economic term, guy, but they've they've uh, certainly. Uh, increase the supply coming into the world markets and all these other countries, including the U.S., having a hard time competing with them. Yeah, I just might make a closing comment here on the international freight markets. We saw the Baltic dry index come off a bit in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I think that's reflective of sort of waning demand, particularly in the wake of the uh, shipping problems we're seeing, not only in Panama with the drought and the restriction of uh, transit through the Panama now, but also looking at that uh, Red Sea Suez Canal situation with the conflicts increasing there, that generally would be raising uh, freight rates across the board internationally. But the fact that the dry bulk index has been coming off sort of really indicates to me we're seeing a, a bit of waning demand, not, not just for grain, but for coal and iron ore, which are the two big drivers there. Uh, it, with those challenges at both Panama and Suez Canal, it is in significantly increasing the transit times and the routes across uh, all those commodities that have to take alternative routes. And when you're competing like in Panama for slots to go through the canal, those high value container ships are going to uh, take priority than a something hauling a, a iron ore or grain, which are cheaper commodities compared to uh, manufactured goods. Yeah. Guy, Dan, I appreciate you both taking the time to join us today and share with us some information from the recent WASDE report. Shelby, thank you very much. We appreciate it. That was the senior economist at the IGP Institute at K-State, Guy Allen, and K-State grain economist, Dan O'Brien. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. <laughs> 